So, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and uh, welcome to the second Honeycomb Hive Live event. Um, thank you all very much for coming out this evening. Uh, it's great to see you all here. So, uh, just a tiny bit of housekeeping before we get going. Firstly, the bathrooms are over here on my left hand side. The fire exit is through the same door that we came in. And uh, I have a quick apology to make uh, on behalf of uh, Andrew Kokodi from AO.com, uh, who has extended uh, sincere apologies. He's unable to make it down to join us this evening. Um, however, rest assured, we have brands well represented on the panel with us today. So the subject for uh, this evening's session is workflow. And we decided that this would be a particularly pertinent and relevant subject, given that one of the things that we all consistently experience is inconsistency and change. You know, whether that's in our political uh, spectrum, the economy, and how that reflects the, uh, the ambitions and the intentions of brands, which are then obviously conveyed to uh, agencies and, and throughout our entire industry workflow. So we thought that would be a great opportunity for us to kind of come together and share some thinking around how that change uh, is addressed as an opportunity, a challenge. Um, and to that subject, to, to that purpose, um, I asked a group of people who I know work right at the coal front of, of that change uh, across our uh, industry to come and join me to kind of really kind of get this conversation going. I've changed the, uh, the format slightly, so we're not going to do um, old presentations. What we're going to do is thought-provoking uh, Q&A sessions. And obviously, you, know, you guys sat here um, in the industry that you are in are as much thought leaders as anybody else sat up here. So your thoughts and feelings and opinions uh, will be hugely appreciated and will massively contribute towards the, the success of this evening. But to get the conversation rolling and to kind of think about how uh, workflows are evolving uh, across our industry, um, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, the panel to you who are going to lead the conversation this evening. Um, I propose what we do is I'm going to uh, introduce very quickly these guys, give each of them sort of two minutes to sort of say hello and introduce who they are and, and, and obviously their business. Um, and then I'm going to sort of just, just tuck in with a, with, with a bunch of questions. Uh, that I hope are sort of thought-provoking. But obviously, what I'd like you guys to do is kind of uh, participate as much as possible as well. So thinking about that workflow, right at the top end, uh, we have the kind of consultants um, and the guys who are um, really reflecting the needs of the brands. So in that respect, I'm very lucky to have Mr. Pat Murphy from Murphy Cobb Associate with us this evening. Coming downstream from there, uh, we've got, um, we, we've got uh, Luke Hammersley, um, who wears two hats, uh, a stripy horse hat, uh, so that's post-production, and his um, zebra worldwide hat, so that's content and uh, version localization. Coming down from there, we've then, um, very fortuitously, I recently met um, Nick from CNIT. Uh, now, CNIT is a, a fabulous piece of uh, emerging technology, and technology sits very much at the heart of the change that's going on. Um, and as, a, as a, sort of a, a conduit of that change, Nick is going to bring some great insight around how new technology is forming and shaping and responding to the needs of the industry. Working down the workflow, uh, straight into the, uh, the, 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 the programmatic side, um, I've got Moritz. Now, Moritz is, 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 is one of my bosses, so I'll be really easy on the questions with him. But Moritz is a, a real genuine proponent of programmatic. Um, and understands the kind of challenges, the nuances of the, the whole kind of uh, nebulous subject of programmatic. So I want to ask Moritz um, and uh, sort of tuck into that subject uh, as to you know, what the realities are and what the challenges are. Um, then we kind of, you know, if you come downstream from there again, then you're broadcasting something, aren't you? So hugely lucky to have David Sanderson, um, who leads Sky's AdSmart. Uh, David, uh, who leads Sky's AdSmart uh, here in the UK. Um, addressable television, uh, so it's the, you know, the golden child of a TV broadcast, so we'll have an opportunity to talk to him. Um, and then sort of sitting over all of us, like the sort of ethereal uh, knowledge base that he is, uh, the one and only uh, Mr. Matt Cooper, who, as most of you know, uh, is uh, Mr. Little Black Book, um, and has a, a real knowledge and insight around the general activities and needs of both brands and agencies. So, 
That's the format. No questions so far. I'm going to ask each of these guys just to give you a couple of quick minutes, and then we'll get on with some questions. So can I just start at the top of the, uh, the workflow? Pat, can I go to you? Can I steal one of these microphones? Um, thank you very much. Great to see so many familiar faces tonight. Um, and I see that everyone's congregated quite near to the bar, so no one at the front here. So when I'm empty, I'm going to hand it over to you uh, to, to fill up. Um, MCA, Murphy Cobb Associates, started in 2005 in my um, third bedroom in uh, southwest London in Putney. And uh, the reason uh, I set it up is because no one wanted to hire me in an agency. Um, I'd been at a company called Adstream, and they booted me out. Um, so I have a love-hate relationship with those guys. Um, so uh, w when I started MCA, it was about uh, helping clients um, make the best out of their budgets, really. Um, it started out mainly as a TV production consultancy. Um, and everyone thinks of us as a cost consultant, but that's not how I really wanted to be. Um, I didn't really think there was any value in, uh, in approaching budgets in the old cost control model. So I thought, right, let's do it in a slightly smarter way. And I know Alex is going to come on and ask me questions about that in a minute. Um, so in the last 13 years, we've grown really off the back of that, uh, not only helping them do uh, TV, but across all of the various different channels. So I would call ourselves production investment strategists or production investment optimizers. Um, and we work uh, with many of the world's biggest clients now. So we have uh, and they're on 100, maybe a few more uh, consultants around the globe in different places. Uh, so we have a good global footprint. And we're um, very happy to be here tonight. Hopefully, uh, we can get a bit controversial. Thanks, Pat. Coming downstream for you then, can we hand the mic over to Luke? Luke, can you give us a quick introduction? Cheers, yeah. Um, Hello. I've got to sing right into the mic. Is that right? Um, I'm Luke Hammersley. I'm chief exec at uh, Zebra Worldwide. And as Alex mentioned, uh, part of that is includes a production company called Stripey Horse. That's within our group. Um, I founded uh, the company in 2005 with another guy called Nick Franklin, who is our uh, chief creative officer and works out of the Cape Town office now. Um, and before that, I had nothing to do with advertising or production at all. Uh, and I was probably the least qualified person to start a production company, which is what we started in 2005, because prior to that, I was a management consultant. Uh, left uni, went to a company called EY, um, or Ernst & Young as it was called then in the old-fashioned way, um, and uh, later Cap Gemini, uh, and spent basically nine or ten years consulting to a mix of uh, utilities companies, and then later with Cap um, into the public sector, having done uh, a stint at the Depart Department for Work and Pensions, a stint at the Department for Education, and two stints at the Inland Revenue. The third time they asked me to go back to the Inland, Inland Revenue, I resigned. Um, and thought there's got to be something more fun than this. Uh, and uh, but I tell you what, an education. And um, funnily enough, and Pat's just talked about it now. Um, it, it you know this sector that we're in is evolving, and we're seeing what the likes of Accenture and others are doing moving into the space. It's long been a belief of mine that actually those consulting skills and those ways of working with clients and the client centricity uh, are just as relevant in advertising, just as relevant uh, in production uh, as anywhere else. Um, so fast forward. Uh, potted history of Zebra is having been a, a jobbing production company. We quickly saw a need in 06, 07, 08, um, uh, following hot on the heels of the, the, the hairy bouffant that is Steve Parrish and his breaking of ground in the, in the versioning and adaptation space to support brands who didn't really understand uh, how to get best value out of, uh, uh, out of the post-production services often and the agency relationships they had where at the end of uh, creating a master commercial, um, it was sort of, it was not clear who should take responsibility for that. Um, so we stepped into that space and we started helping clients initially brokering post services and uh, keeping uh, budgets honest. Um, and then we thought, well, actually, we can do a lot of that post production. So we built post facilities. Uh, we now have six offices around the world, um, uh, with the exception of Americas, we're in every continent. And um, in 09, we put, a, put together a joint venture partnership with what was then DDB London, is now Adam and Eve DDB. And uh, so we sort of backed the right horse there uh, at the right time. Um, it's been an incredible relationship to be a part of uh, that journey with that um, uh, organization and see how the, the machinations of Omnicom work has, has been a, a true education. Um, we're working with some of the biggest clients in the world now, the Unilevers, Mars Wrigley's, Cisco, uh, brands like this, uh, with them. But also independently, our recent wins are with Rekit Benkiza, with parts of LVMH, uh, with Eon Electricity, uh, so we're punching well you know, above our weight, I think, for a relatively small company. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. 
Uh, uh, 17, we will do probably about 3,500 TVC adaptations. We will shoot about 12 or 14 commercials um, outright uh, through Stripey Horse. We bill in, I checked this today, we bill in about 10 different currencies, which is a lot more complex than it sounds, I can tell you. Um, so yeah, we're a properly international business. And you know what, we're having a lot of fun doing it. So that's a bit about us. Thanks, Luke. Is that five minutes? Sorry. I was enjoying myself. Good. Nick, can I introduce you? Fill my time for the mic. Um, so, uh, well, uh, uh, after uh, Luke's introduction, uh, I'm, I'm really the minnow, I think, on this panel. Um, Nick Vercruz, COO at a tech company called CNIT. Uh, we are three and a half years old, and uh, I'm in a steam company because I think we're still learning, really, along our journey. Uh, we're, we're right at the beginning of this, and we have a lot more to learn on the way. Um, in a nutshell, uh, CNIT... Uh, is a tech platform that allows any brand to turn their customers, their fans, their advocates, their employees into their own film crew and use that film crew to convey their brand message uh, and to start to work with those guys to really build strong advocates. So to give a couple examples, um, we're working with Benefit, the cosmetics brand right now, who are turning both their employees in store but also some of their top uh, customers online uh, into their reviewers who come onto YouTube and talk about the new products that they're releasing and advocate or otherwise criticize some of those products. And that sits all within the benefit stream of content that they embrace. Um, on the other side of the table, we also work with broadcasters like BT Sport uh, who are trying to bring fans who are sitting there in the game at half-time and full-time to bring their commentary into the live uh, uh, pundit show that Jake Humphreys fronts uh, on a Saturday afternoon. Um, and the whole concept of this is to try and bring those people for whom uh, are the most passionate about the subject they're talking about into the conversation, have them really tell the story from their perspective, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, three and a half years old, uh, we've got a long way to go, and uh, fascinating to see what this panel has in store. So that's me. Thanks, Nick. Moritz, quick two minutes. Sure. Um, uh, I'm Moritz. I'm CEO of Honeycomb. Uh, and... Uh, I've been working in this digital distribution business since 2005 when I, when I met James together. And um, so I know a little bit about digital distribution and television space. But as uh, Alex mentioned, my background is really about digital. So I come from a digital advertising um, technology side, working for a large media rep company around the world selling media space. So I have a good understanding of the media buying problems and the distribution sides and what publishers, broadcasters need to do to optimize their revenue streams and how agencies and media agencies and production houses try to get more, more value out of the, the media that they're buying. So <clears throat> in a nutshell, an interesting space we're in today and um, with Honeycomb being the programmatic leading platform for digital distribution, um, it's a really interesting space. Uh, that we're going to encounter in the next three to five years. So, welcome to the change. Thanks, Moritz. David, broadcast this. Right. Um, David Sanderson, I'm, I'm, I run the business development team at Sky AdSmart. Uh, we're really excited about AdSmart at Sky. It's, things are pretty good at Sky. We've got 21 million customers across five countries. And whenever Sky talks to the city about those sort of numbers, AdSmart always gets a mention, which is, which is nice because it's still relatively young. Um, it's doing pretty well. We've got over 1,400 advertising customers that have used it. Of those, about 75% had never used TV or never used Sky before. And actually, over 500 were c a pure new-to-TV brands. And what's exciting about it is that ask anyone about TV and they'll go, yeah, great, brand building, fame, wonderful, but probably a bit expensive for us. If you say to those same people, wouldn't it be great if you could just target the households that matter to your business? And wouldn't it be great if you only paid for those homes if you knew they'd seen the ad? That tends to change their view. And that's a really fun conversation to have with a whole range of businesses. And we deal with businesses spending at our minimum, which is £3,000 as a campaign cost, up to brands spending three quarters of a million like Mercedes-Benz, with some really elite brands that pop up in between, like McLaren and so on and so forth. So it's a really exciting space to be in and um, no week is, uh, is ever the same. In terms of me, I was at ITV, or in ITV, specifically Carlton, for 15 years. I'm at the end of it. Um, and I've been at Sky for about five years and then in between the two I spent 10 years running businesses. Um, some of which were to do with TV, a production company, 
some of which were nothing to do with TV, and funny enough, found it really hard to market themselves effectively against their national counterparts. And that's what we now help people do, level the playing field between national brands and regional and aspirational brands. Hello, hello. Okay. So uh, I know most of you. My name is Matt Cooper. Um, I am the founder, I guess, of a company called Little Black Book. Little Black Book is a business that started, I've got no idea any years ago, but I think it's seven, perhaps something like that. Um, started as a bit of a joke. Uh, my background is I was at Sarch's, then the mill, post production company with Ben and Dan, who are here. Um, we then did various other things. Um, Little Black Book started as kind of an insider's guide to a city. So I was traveling a lot. I'd write about New York, where to eat, sleep, drink, and who to meet as a creative person. Um, John Hegarty really pushed me on to say, you could do more with that. And think about what you did with Beam TV at the mill, which was a, an asset management solution, I guess. Um, what he said to me was, was that as a creative director, he has to buy 60 publications to keep up with what is going on in the world of advertising. Um, I studied this a bit and found out actually there are 1,100. So that's a bit of a fucking mess, quite frankly. So, so what, we, what we did was we, we looked at the world and thought, is there a way we could create one platform that would cover the world of advertising? And what, we, what that meant was, was post-production, production, and advertising, and client, all in one place. So we became kind of a bit of a fame factory. Um, if you're an agency, or a production company, or a post house, we've created a platform where you can place your work and news, and you can guarantee eyeballs. We've got about 200,000 creators and brands a month. This isn't hits and clicks, it's unique people coming to the site to read about the world of advertising. So what we've kind of done away with in a way is the need for things like campaign, uh, shots, I probably shouldn't say this, um, ad age and all, and all these different publications because the thing is is that you know they, they sat and behaved like local publications. We've become a global one and you can come to us and read about everyone from BBH to The Mill to Honeycomb to Droga 5 to whoever you want to read about and um, what we're on the end of now is a lot of very interesting phone calls because I think we'll go into this this evening is that you know a lot of the clients and agencies and others don't quite know what's happening and are seeing us as a place to call for fixes. Thanks, Matt. So, could we could start with the first question? And I think that one of the things that you know we've all addressed is kind of the, the, the change being driven down from 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 the clients. So, I suppose the first question would be. How have you seen the brands change their behavior over the last few years? And how has that impacted how you um, have done business or are, in some cases, beginning to do business? So can I, to Pat, can I bring you in first? Because obviously you sit at the top of that. How are you seeing brands evolve? Sure. Um, there's two questions there. One is how have I seen brands change? Uh, over the few years, last few years. I think that started probably uh, in about 2008 uh, when we had obviously all the financial troubles. And um, what happened there was uh, was the rise of procurement. And uh, we've seen the rise and rise of procurement in recent years. Now, has that been a good thing? Uh, it can be. Um, I think that the challenge there is finding procurement, um, I suppose, champions of, of great creative. Um, and it's very difficult because there's a there's a balance um, there between cost and creativity, and I think a lot of procurement uh, folk find it hard to understand uh, the creative process and how to buy well uh, creative services. And so, you know, they need I certainly think they need a lot of support in doing that. Um, but I do see the evidence of them trying to do a lot of it themselves. So I think, I think that's been a big change. That's been a big shift in recent years. But I think there's another shift that's happened more recently, which is the, the appetite for marketers to work directly with uh, independent suppliers. Uh, and I think that's been driven by the fact that budgets haven't gone up, but they need to create more stuff. Um, so I, I think that that's been not only a big change, but it's fantastic for the industry, for independent suppliers 
who want to build a relationship directly with brands. And uh, that's uh, 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 exactly what Matt was touching on just a se second ago. So that's what I've seen the big change on the marketing side. How have we adapted um, uh, to that is that we've had to be flexible as a business. Uh, and as I said, we're not about necessarily cost control because I think cost control in the traditional sense is dead. Um, I think it's about uh, finding ways to help get the maximum out of a budget. Uh, so working collaboratively with creative partners of a, of a client, and that might be an agency, it might be directly with a production house or a post house, uh, whoever, but it's working collaboratively uh, with whoever those creative partners are to make sure that they, they max out on whatever the budget is on the table. And you know, I was sitting with uh, a client only a couple of days ago uh, with Jane who's sitting over there in the corner. And I said, what's your budget? And they said, 250 grand. And I said, fantastic, we're going to spend it all. Is that OK? Yes, but we'll get you the biggest bang for your buck. So that's kind of where I see things have changed and how we've adapted. Brilliant. I'd, I'd, at that point, David, I've got to bring you into this part of the conversation, because obviously what AdSmart um, are doing is opening the doors to broadcast that previously was kind of unaffordable. So how have you... Um, as a business, kind of recognize those opportunities? And who are the types of brands that obviously you're now able to talk to who traditionally just weren't able to enter the kind of traditional ad mix? It's, it's hard to know where to start in that respect. I mean, you know, Sky does a billion pounds a year from brands that, that are happy to advertise nationally to pretty much everyone and need to, to build awareness. And that excludes, uh, that sounds good, but the local and regional ad market in the UK is worth about five billion. Half of that is on Google and the rest is on local press and radio. And they're all brands that by either choice or, or, or jurisdiction have to advertise locally or regionally. They either have a license to operate within a postcode or they're a law firm that only choose to operate in Chichester, wherever it might be. And uh, that, that closes TV out. And the, the wonderful thing about addressable advertising is that you can contain it and make it relevant geographically but where we differ is that we add the ability to add impact and I know that from having run a regional business there's lots of clever ways to be addressable and to deliver to the right geography but it's very hard to actually stand out and to to repeat myself to to be able to compete on a level playing field and appear full screen high definition you know uh, as as any ma mainstream brand would for a local business is enormous power uh, and I think will for years to come, people will go, hang on, I've just seen my local Audi dealer in Game of Thrones. How did that happen? Um, and uh, that's really exciting to talk to businesses about that. So we you know, have so many fascinating conversations with businesses that are waking up to the idea that this is an option. Um, and the creative challenges and content are absolutely critical to overcoming them. So have I sort of answered the question? Have I rambled a bit? Yeah, I think for me, you know, the, the, the importance of content um, comes right to the fore, and obviously it's a main proponent of the, the AdSmart offering. Um, and, and Luke, I need to pull you in right now, because obviously versioning uh, is a major part of your business, and that's something that you obviously will have seen change in terms of a client need over the last few years. So the content and the versioning, how, how has the, the client's uh, reality impacted the work uh, and the methods of workflow that you're executing? Um, I think, <laughs> firstly... We don't talk about versioning, and this is not just semantics. We talk about localization, and that's a, there's a big difference for me. Versioning may be part of the localization process. In other words, making something slightly different from what you have. But it speaks to the heart of what these guys are saying, which is it's still about creativity. And the fact that we may take a piece of master creative and, and want to make it work in Russia, but it was made in the US. You know, our job's really important. It's a, it's a creative job. It's not stop being creative, because it, it happens to be uh, taking something that somebody's already created and, and, and repurposing it. So. The idea of um, localization and of expectation then in, in clients' mind is, is very often the first thing we have to do is, is shift the conversation. Um, because we may have been brought in because of a procurement exercise where you know, uh, typically the start point is price as a driver. Now for marketers, if we can get them into that conversation, because sometimes procurement separate that from, from marketing, then uh, which is good if we can have that conversation together, then we can start to talk about the other things that drive uh, you know, a need for change, such as uh, quality. Um, and I don't just mean uh, the technical quality of an asset, which can be dubious, but um, the creative quality. So it's how do we bake that back in um, and still be cost effective? How do we improve things like speed to market? Um, well, working with guys like Honeycomb House. Um, but in other words, pick the right technology, pick the right partners, 
And very often now, we find ourselves, as I say, at the start of the conversation, helping shape the client's expectations. They came to us for one reason, but by the time, hopefully, we finish doing our first phase job, which is really digging into the whys and wherefores, it's, um, it, it's shaped very differently. Uh, and that's then a far more meaningful set of conversations as to how we can go on to build better solutions for, um, for things like uh, localization and, uh, and, and versioning and so on. So in terms of then sort of local, uh, localization, um, it's a little bit of a tenuous link, but I want to kind of bring Moritz in uh, at this point because the whole subject of um, sort of programmatic and, 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 and sort of address online addressable feels like a sort of this sort of ethereal nebulous thing that everyone's striving towards, but no one's really getting there. Now, obviously, you've got the likes of Zebra striving towards developing brilliant localization. How far are we in terms of being able to deliver to the brand easily achievable and affordable programmatic delivery? Um, interesting because, uh, I mean, I just came back from De Mexico in Cologne, which is in Europe now the largest digital advertising fair. Uh, roughly about 15,000 visitors in two days, every day, 15,000 who come and, you know, get an inspiration of what's the latest trend. And programmatic, um, which is the leading theme over the last three years um, in television doesn't really exist the same way as it exists in online. Because programmatic in online means that you're automating a buy, a media buy, with overlaying the audience onto a media schedule. And the audience targeting is through third party audience data. So you have cookie data, you have buying patterns, you have demographics, and specific audience you're overlaying with a habit and therefore you can target the data. That is just not possible on linear TV today. So AdSmart is an exception in that because what they call addressable is really you're able to target a household, which is fantastic. In the end for an advertiser who wants to be very efficient in spending his money, as David just mentioned, if he knows whom he wants to target, he can do that with AdSmart. But on a linear channel, you can't do that. So we're talking lots about programmatic in TV, but it is just the automated buying that is programmatic, but not actually the selection of the household. So we need to be careful when we use programmatic in TV. And um, overall, I, I think we're gonna have the same programmatic that we have in online or addressable in, in the TV space. Um, I would say in about three years or four years uh, in the UK with more than 50% or 60% of the total households in Germany with all the channels, at the moment being there is about only two channels who have that addressable uh, accessibility with a different technology. Uh, in America, it's moving very fast as well. Um, so in about five years, I think we'll have about 80% of all the channels that you can buy really programmatically or addressable. And that's a really nice opportunity for advertisers to spend their money more targeted. And if they don't want to target so precisely, they can still buy linear the way that you bought it today, or you're buying it today, which is the great, the best mass media that exists. So uh, I think it's a, it's a three, three to five year program, um, and it won't happen overnight. But clearly with AdSmart, and now Virgin, as I understand, um, being added to the, the AdSmart bucket, um, the UK is pretty well set in, in being able to buy audiences addressable uh, with Sky and, and Virgin. Thanks, Bryce. And Nick, talking about content and localization, obviously that is absolutely front and center of what you guys are doing. So who, who's been the early adopters of your technology? Who have you, who have you found most receptive to a new tech startup, three and a half years old? So I think for us, I mean, we service sort of three main categories. I and mean, obviously brands and, and who are looking to try and market their, their, their wares is obviously one big one. But actually the early adopter for us has been corporates. Um, most of our client list you would find on the FTSE 100. Um, and they're not necessarily using it just to talk about the brand publicly. They're using it to also talk about that brand and how it resonates internally. Take an organization like HSBC, quarter of a million employees around the world, 
run, I mean, their entire employee engagement function run out of an office based here in the headquarters in, in Canary Wharf. How does that office now try and convey a message that everybody in that organization can relate to post 2008 where every media organization and everyone else they knew branded a banker as you know for what you know one of a better word a criminal and you had an environment where, where you know hsbc employees were afraid to go onto the tube with an hsbc backpack it was that severe you know right after that crisis happened how do you suddenly rekindle the brand and what that stands for and the values of this fantastic organization to all those people within that organization. Um, and the way that they try to do that is to actually turn the microphone over to them and say, you know what, a big shiny head office in London can't be the one that dictates what this message is. Actually, we want that message to come from the employees and that's where they started. And that's now been a trend that we've seen all the way through where you typically, in a large organization, you've got a marketing department, very well funded, typically, although budgets obviously are under pressure. And you have a internal communications HR recruitment department, which has a fraction of that budget to play with. And what's interesting is working with both of those teams often, the difference in how they approach you in a conversation. Um, typically, what we found is that those internal communications teams are much more prepared to carry a lot of the burden of executing a lot of what it is that they produce. Usually because they have never had the budget to do that anyway. They've never had the luxury of working with an agency because they can't afford to. So everything they do is organic. They do it all themselves. You go and have a similar conversation with their marketing department, it's much, much harder. But coming back to your earlier question of what have we seen change, we're now in a position where we're educating the marketing teams at Benefit on how to edit video themselves. Never would have thought we could do that three years ago. I mean, that's phenomenal. And that's, I think, the change that we're seeing in the brand's recognition that they can do a lot of this without necessarily having to bring in an agency with their overheads to execute it. Um, and that's, I think, reflecting in a lot of what we're seeing in the wider industry around the budget cuts and refining down on actually who are we going to work with and who our partner's going to be. So that's really interesting because one of the, <clears throat> what I expected you to say there was the, the agencies were kind of eking you out and leading you front and center into a new set of proposition uh, to respond to the needs of the client. You didn't say that. Clearly, you're working directly with the brand, and that surprises me. So um, I want to kind of move the subject on a little bit to how agencies are addressing the new opportunities that are a result of the challenges of the market. And Matt, I'm going to, can I get you to kind of wade in here? You're, you're across all of them. I think, I think they're struggling. Is, is the answer. I think that, you know, things are changing so quickly now. In the office, we kind of refer to it as the Wild West at the moment. I think that, um, honestly, I think the brands in many ways don't quite know, your brand says what they do, what they want. They don't quite know where to put it, and they don't quite know who should make it. So I think, to me, we've ended up in a place where we've got more people making more stuff than ever. And most of that stuff, people don't want to watch. So, so I think that is a real problem there because I think that you know what people need to do is take a bit of a deep breath and concentrate on what they're they're making and who they're making it with, who their partners are. Because obviously, a lot of the agencies now are beginning to create their own internal um, production areas um, to to take on more stuff. And I don't think that's benefiting many people. I think that you know the spend's still there. You get more stuff created that more people don't want to watch. And I think that. Niels Leonard made a really good point. I think yesterday in a, a press release, he's just, you know, Niels Leonard of Grey, he's just left and started a new agency called On Common. And he made a really good point. His point was, um, we've got the skip ad button now, right? That's everywhere. So, you know, I'm watching Sky TV, great new thing, uh, Tin Star. I'm not watching a single ad. Um, I'm downloading it. I'm not watching ads. And, and his point was, we're not just skipping ads, we're skipping brands. And that's a problem that the agencies have to try and fix, I think. Uh, but but my, my, my thing is is that we're, we're making, the agencies are producing areas now perhaps that are making too much stuff that people don't want to watch. And they need to fix that. Pat, in terms of that disparity then between yes. the consumer, what the consumer wants, and you know, I'm, I'm going to hold my hand up as well. I, I actively avoid watching advertising. Um, I can't stand it. Absolutely. Um, but at the same time, the brands want to produce more and more and more of this stuff. Correct. I think 
I have to echo exactly what Matt just said. Um, I think there is so much stuff that is crap. I mean, it really, you wouldn't watch it. And I'm, one of, I'm, I'm, I'm a culprit. You know, I watch Netflix and Amazon. I avoid all the ads, right? What am I doing here? I'm in the ad business, and I try and avoid them. Um, but somebody, interestingly, I don't know if you've seen it, somebody interestingly posted um, a talk that David Droger did at the Creative Forum in uh, 2016 on Facebook last night. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. And it's, and it's John Doris. That was the person who posted it. Thank you to John Doris, because I hadn't seen it before. And it was absolutely brilliant, because... He talks about starting with the customer uh, and working backwards. Uh, and it's, a, a real, it's, a, it's 30 minutes. Go and watch it. Uh, and I think it's all about building experiences. It's not just about making TV ads that no one's going to watch. And so uh, I, I think that's a, a great way to look at it. And I think what's happened now is that clients are looking at their agencies and saying, well, maybe we should be doing a lot of this stuff ourselves. So they're building a lot of in-house capability uh, to do the stuff that they, you know, that's very easy, but they still want to hire great creative. They need great creative uh, champions. They need great creative uh, directors. And obviously there's loads of people out there to be able to do that. And people like Niels is a, a good example. Um, and I, I think that the agencies themselves um, are shooting themselves in the foot right now. So it'll be very interesting if you go back... Back and look at my blog in the uh, back end of last year on LBB. I said, will the agency model survive 2017? Well, uh, the momentum is building towards moving away from that agency model, the traditional agency model. Uh, so that's, that's what I think. So the proliferation of content. Um, Luke, can I, bring, I want to bring you in uh, again because obviously you know, this, this proliferation of content then in my mind raises the question of, the, the, the number of media available. So you've got traditional TVC, uh, sort of or online uh, versus addressable uh, versus social media. Um, are, are these being used effectively and efficiently? Or do you, do you think that the consumer's got to a point where they're so cheesed off with the, the kind of constant barrage of content that there is a, a lesson to be learned by the industry that says, we all need to be, we've got more, but we need to be smarter with it. Well, the short answer would be yes. But um, <clears throat> the slightly longer answer might be, I, Dave Golding wrote a really interesting article earlier in the year from uh, Admin FDDB about this idea of uh, culture versus collateral. And it starts to address, it. He, his context was, you know, what sort of agency do you want to be? And of course, he's having a pop at the other side of the fence um, when you've got, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of agencies sort of moving hard be through these production outfits into this idea of let's create more collateral. Um, I think it's a bit more sophisticated and far be it from me to disagree with David Golding because he's got about 85 million more reasons to be successful than I have according to the news this week. But um, I take him up on one thing which is I don't think they need to be mutually exclusive. I think the idea of collateral being a really rich, entertaining, inspiring, educational, informative uh, thing that um, people enjoy consuming in whatever media channel, it doesn't matter whether it's a TV set or a, or a mobile phone, I know this is the thing that you know it's talked about a lot recently, but it still needs to be really bloody good, and it still needs to entertain and educate and inspire us and all do all those things. So, yes, there is too much crap, and I think actually the brands need to take responsibility. And a lot of the conversations we have with marketing teams is one of two things: either there is a disconnected idea of what content means. So I have a PR agency, I have a creative agency, I have a social agency, I have a digital agency, and I have a marketing team, and there's still too many silos. Um, and the client needs to step up and take responsibility for having a content strategy that they own not rely on an agency that they can then fire for not being as good as they want them to be later on. So that's what I would say is man up. People talk a lot about award ceremonies of the client was really brave and they chose this really out there piece of creative. Well, I'll tell you what, be brave and own your content strategy is what I'd say to clients. And then you can start to actually talk to your customers in an informed way. You've got to get your head around data. You've got to understand how, you know, we, we started talking about this funny little concept of uh, uh, data overnight, uh, insight for breakfast, uh, strategy and creative by lunchtime, uh, production in the afternoon, implementation in the evening, and data again overnight. And that's the way you've got to think. You've got to bring all that stuff together and then bring your agencies together. The other thing I think I'd like clients to be brave at is taking control of the agency roster or making one of them responsible for bringing everybody together. Because it's too easy to operate in a silo and then point the finger at the other side and say, yeah, well, we didn't have the budget. You know, we We fought for that budget. You should have given it to us. We could have done a better job. Frankly, it's bollocks. So man up and take responsibility. So that 
that level of in, sort of intelligence and application of uh, uh, insight, I, I think, brings me to a question I want to ask you, David, which is, does addressable advertising complement that mix of media, or do you see it sort of as more of a disruptive replacement? Uh, no, look, I think it's completely complementary. But just to put it in context, uh, this idea about you know, terrible content and disengaged audiences just isn't true in television. Uh, TV viewing 10 years on, uh, well, 10 years ago, where the web penetration was under 50%, uh, TV viewing was three and a half hours a, uh, a, a day on average. Ten year, today, it's the same, and, t and internet penetration has doubled. And the, the rubbish that we're talking about isn't on TV. TV viewing, TV content is has got increasingly good box sets, downloads, all that stuff. There's some great stuff in there. And if people choose to download and fast forward, as you described, you do, and plenty do, that's fine. That's smart world because no one's charging you for anything. We can only charge you if you see it. Um, the the interesting thing that in the world I and we'll come back to your point in a minute, but you know, I go around the country talking to real people, not marketing people or media people. We are, I was in Nottingham last week, room full of 80 SME owners coordinated by NatWest Bank, who had us in Google talking to businesses about how to target effectively, which is a pretty good endorsement. And I try to play a bit of a game saying, just think of an ad that's worked for you in the last week, month, whatever it might be, and just let them stew on that for 30 seconds, and then ask them if anyone's seen a, pr a Facebook ad that they can remember, or a press ad they want to talk about, or and, and no hands ever go up. I think there's one bloke once in Leeds put his hand up about a Facebook ad. Um, and then you ask about TV, and all the hands go up. And these are the people that are skipping ads and, and claiming not to see anything. And, and when we run campaigns after elusive, upmarket, affluent, busy male audiences, for example, we find that channels like Sky Sports News, which, let's face it, no one records, uh, all watch live does a disproportionate amount of impression delivery because guess what? The interesting thing you want to see what Wayne Rooney's been up to is the other side of the ad break. So we kind of get them eventually. It, to answer the specific question, it's at the beginning. Uh, the same event last week featured Google and they were said, we are at the heart of anyone's advertising strategy, which means they're in the middle. Uh, and that means the journey starts somewhere else. And where TV's lost out in the past is not being able to claim any attribution for where that journey starts. And we know that TV lands an idea, changes behavior in a way that nothing else can, but we historically have lost that. And it sort of then filters through and people turn up at a car dealer saying, oh yeah, I found you by looking at Google, which literally means I found your address in many cases. Um, so we're at the beginning and we're, we're changing behavior, we're, we're adding incremental conquest customers to people's business, and that is supplemented and amplified by everything else that a brand can do. So it's it, it, proper good, integrated marketing campaign should include it, uh, but at the beginning of a journey, not instead of anything else. So I saw a report a couple of weeks ago by Credit Suisse. Um, Moritz, this is probably one heading down your way. Uh, and Credit Suisse was saying that by 2030, US TV ad spend would double to be in a region of $100 billion a year, which kind of flies in the face of crap being produced, people avoiding advertising. Um, how does that work, Moritz? I mean, how, how are we going to see a doubling in US TV spend producing crap and shit that people are just avoiding? It's, I was really surprised when I read that report and uh, uh, because I thought, you know, 2% growth over annual, uh, over the next 10 years, that's what had been predicted so far. And <clears throat> the reason for change of view is that because television can be more targeted, it will take some advertising dollars from the YouTubes, from the online area, which has proven actually not that effective. <laughs> so with that challenge that advertisers want to spend their money more wisely, more targeted, getting real buck for their money, so I don't know which 50% have been spent wrongly, no, I want to spend 100% correctly, that story going forward will be possible with addressable targeted TV. So in America, there's a company called Samuel Media. They, they do addressable basically on a very analytical way by scrapping lots of data. So Luke's point about data. Data will become super, super relevant going forward because you can analyze so much about customer behavior, about viewership data, 
So if the McLaren or CNA creates a, CNA is a good example, if CNA creates a campaign and puts that on, let's say, AdSmart tomorrow, um, they could have immediate results on that AdSmart campaign because AdSmart gives them data about relevance, about viewership, and on Linear TV, Honeycomb has just now introduced a fingerprinting uh, uh, data, which allows us 30 minutes after a spot has been broadcasted on television, on linear television, to give that data back to the advertiser. Not nine days, not 12 days, but 30 minutes after. So if CNA made a campaign on linear television today, they could relate that ad spend immediately on the next day with sales in the stores. And that relevance is, I think, the huge opportunity for television going forward because as of now, that was only available in online and mobile. And P&G, Unilever, they just announced that they're going to drop, I think, 20% of their digital spend because they've proven not that effective. So I think that's a huge opportunity for, for TV. But obviously, it's all about engagement. It's about the right ad. And um, A-B testing, um, having you know, multiple ads. We see, for example, Mini as an advertiser, they, they made a campaign with 30 different variations of the same ad, not only for geographic targeting, but because of different customer targeting. So great, great opportunity for you guys, 30 different ads. Um, and they're trying it out. And they want to see the performance of that ad working in that geographic uh, target with that audience. So really interesting, I think. Just, just to kind of, just to, to, to respond to that. I mean, I think what, what we've got, because we've got, you know, we've got Matt here saying, nobody's watching TV, everyone's skipping the ads, you're recording it all just so I don't have to watch it. Then, then obviously, um, Credit Suisse, I think you wrote the report saying actually ad spend is going to double on television. I think what we've got, which is exactly the problem the agencies are facing, is you've now got different generations who are whose who's home base is a different basis of technology, who engage with content, brands, the TV shows that we love in completely different ways. So having a single unified brand campaign to target that entire base is now almost impossible. And I think that's, that's the problem that we've all got. Um, and depending on which demographic you're talking about, all of these points are true, but all these points are also completely incorrect. And I think that's the problem that we've got to try and face is, how, so how do you address that world? What, is it, what does the new age agency need to look like if it's going to be successful all across that demographic base? Or does a brand put its hand up and say, you know what, actually, I'm going to pick my segment. and I'm just going to focus on that. Build credibility, build rapport, build awareness, cross my fingers, hope I've done enough, and let that generation mature and then focus on the next one. Um, I don't have an answer for that, but um, but I think that's what that's that, the effect we're seeing. That's what I was about to say. Is it working? Hello, hello, hello. Um, I was about to say a very similar thing. I think that um, you know that that report. I don't I don't quite know if that's true or not. But the rise of Amazon is it working? It's not. The rise of the rise of Amazon Prime in the US is is massive. It's huge, and there's a, there's a reason for that. I think. Um, Talking about Sky, you know, when I download the thing I'm watching, I didn't ask to skip the ads. I got the program without the ads. That's the way it appears in my box. Um, I'm probably the biggest fan here of a TV ad. But if you talk to people in my office, um, one of them watches TV. It's 15 people. So I think back to what you're saying. What, what we've got to start doing is creating stuff that the people you're trying to sell to actually watch. And there are great examples of it. You know, there are people like, there's a brand called Patter, which is a, uh, a street a street brand for kids who are making brilliant content. Vans are doing some brilliant stuff and have channels of really well created content that people want to watch. But I think that it's got to be targeted. And I think at the moment people are just continuing to churn out this crap that they're they're looking back at and saying, well, why aren't we making sales from this stuff? Um, and I think you know, I, I, it's interesting. I watched a, a a Facebook speech the other day, a, a, an hour long, telling us uh, you know the power of Facebook and how we're, 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 we, we need to make, start making six-second content because people are skipping it after six seconds. They're skipping because it's crap. It's not because we watch things for six seconds. It's because it's crap. I mean, that's, that's the facts.
Sorry, also just to chip in on that, there's also a, a different deal in place with Facebook. If when, you're on, when you're on Facebook, social media is great because you're there to see what your friends are doing, what your family's doing. Social media marketing isn't because that's not part of the deal. I don't want to be advertised to when I'm seeing what my sister's doing on holiday. It's just a different deal. If you're watching Tin Star, and I've done the same as you, I've downloaded it, no ads, that's our fault. Um, but if you're watching a show like that, and it's Game of Thrones, and it's appointment viewing, you want to watch it not a second later than anyone else's, you will sit through the ads, because it's a fair deal. That show costs tens of millions of dollars to make, and you're going to see some great ads that are probably relevant to you anyway. It's a, it, there's an emotional willingness. And the reason I just say that is not just an opinion, because three years ago when we launched AdSmart, tune away and TV was about 10%. It gets to a commercial break, 10% of the audience buggers off straight away. Always has done. When you start showing more relevant ads, and that's a subliminal thing, it's, oh, oh I won't change channel. Our tune away dropped by 50% to about 5%. And that's been a, a really consistent learning that we've had, which is great. So we're showing people ads, and guess what? They're happy to see them because they're more pertinent. And relevance is... Is, is subjective, um, and we're working quite hard with some really interesting partners, one of whom is here today, Patrick from RT Ad, where we're trying to create generic ads for sectors where you can really go local for businesses that probably can't afford a fully fledged out of their own. So it might be a vet or an IFA or a dentist where we work in an early verbal reference to the place, so you go, oh, hello, that's where I live. And, um, and then you get the detail at the end of it. And if we could do it better, we'd have Cornish accents and Geordie accents and Bristol accents because people perk up, you know, during an ad break if it's relevant. That's why I just dipped in there. It was uninvited. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, I hope that has kind of given some food for thought. What I would like to do now is kind of invite any questions and kind of get going. Um, I just need to ask very quickly, Fee, how long have we got? How, how are we for time? Five. We've got five minutes five left. Ten minutes. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'll declare my bias. I'm Pat COO, so I'll try not to <laughs> sort of leverage it in his favour. Um, <clears throat> we're talking about this world here of disruption and fragmentation and, and the opportunities, I guess, that can come from that particular situation. What I'm really interested in as part of the workflow, a key part of this is that somebody is coming up with a creative concept that then drives everything that follows. So what's interesting is David's talking about actually being able to produce something that's creative at very low cost, which is great, obviously, for the advertisers. Um, obviously, again, Nick is talking about actually using real people as um, influencers and advocates of brands. So actually, what is the role of the conventional above-the-line creative agency in this world of disruption we're talking about? I just come at that uh, to, to come back at that straight away. I think what the experience that we've seen is is I, I, I take exactly your point because we're going in and typically you've got somebody in the brand who has a fantastic idea what they want to do, but it's very um, I would say it's it it has a time limit to it. So we live in a world where we structure our content and creative plans around campaigns that we've all been indoctrined in this way of thinking. Of course, consumers don't think like that. Consumers think 24-7. They're, you know, they're going all the time. Um, and so you're, if you can catch a brand at the point where they've got a real idea and you can execute on that well, what we quickly see is that the brand is starting to open up their creative duties to start to, to really play with that. The challenge that you've got is that they've typically, for us, they've not had the opportunity to do that before because their agency takes a lot of that away from them um, because they've obviously asked them to. Um, and the challenge is as soon as the agency feels like they're you know, sort of playing sort of second fiddle here and you've got this whipper snapper tech startup coming in and saying, oh, you know, we can do it all for you, um, they obviously poke their shoulders out and, and get a little bit feisty. Um, and I think the, the challenge is how do we bridge this gap? We know where the brand wants to go. We know that ultimately they do want to take back more control. How do they do that and be given the freedom to do that without letting go of the car you know, and having to, you know, execute it all on their own without the support to take them there. And that's, I think, where the agency does fit in. I think there's still a huge role for them in bridging that gap between their ambition, new technology, there's a huge execution process. Good question, David. <laughs> May I answer? Um, there's, a, there's a couple of answers to that from my perspective. One is... I think certainly the agency can still have 
a role or play a part in, in that. Um, I think what we're seeing is that great ideas will be, uh, I think great ideas can tra traverse every channel, right? So I think the role of the ad agency going forward will be great ideas, right? That's it. So everything else is up for grabs, right? So I think if I was a client, I'd say, look, I'd still like to hang on to my creative agency for one reason only. I want them to create the best ad ideas for me, and then I'm going to let them go, right? Everything else. And we're seeing that already with some kinds of relationships. We see it with BBH, for instance, with Kraft Heinz. You know, they, Kraft Heinz hire BBH, come up with great ideas, then they hand it off to somebody else. Now, that is a model, I think, which will grow. And certainly, I think that the agency, uh, the agency's responsibility there is, is coming up with great advertising ideas that will, will, will traverse many, many channels. So I think that's one reason, that's one reason to keep them. Um, there's another reason to keep them, I think, is strategy sometimes. Um, so, you know, how do we, you've got to think about the customer, all that kind of stuff. But again, you know, you can find great freelance people who can do that stuff as well. You can find incredibly uh, experienced creative directors who have been let go by the groups. Um, you can find great strategists who have been let go as well. So you can also go and build your own dream team. So it's really horses for courses. But I don't think great ideas need to necessarily be expensive. So if you go to a lot of the countries like you know Ireland, I know Matt knows well, Scandinavia, New Zealand, they don't have big budgets. So they have to work on tiny budgets. And you know what that does? It makes them create really simple ideas. And often, that's the best stuff. Any more questions? That's one for David. Um, love the idea of AdSmart. I think a lot of agencies still don't know the power of it, which is their miss, I think. But for you, what is the best example you've ever seen of an AdSmart campaign? And was it an agency or was it someone that was like a do-it-yourself agency like Pat just discussed? Uh, you know what, I'm going to be a bit glib and say there are quite a lot to choose from in that respect. Um, I'd say there was there's two at, the, at, at either end of the spectrum. There, there is, and I keep going about it, McLaren. They sh they, the, the campaign cost, uh, and to answer the previous question, you know, local probably does mean low cost, but addressable TV is also about niche, and the McLaren is a perfect niche. They excluded 99.5% of the Sky customer base, and they had a fabulous film that they showed to those 60,000 households, and their sales went from six a week to 10 a week. So uh, at £145,000 a car, that's quite a good return. Um, but at the other end, we ran a tiny wee campaign in the northeast of England for an adoption agency. The ad cost 2,000 quid. The campaign cost 3,000 quid. And they, they found one household to, not an adoption agency, a fostering agency, sorry. Um, they found one household to... Uh, find a home for a child, save the local council 50,000 quid a year, brilliant return on investment, wonderful story, changing lives. And that's probably the best example we've got to, to sell people the idea of taking on someone else's life without which it sound too emotional. It's a bit of a big deal. So anywhere between those two points, there's lots of good stories. Um, it's really about culture, um, because uh, in a sense, the word creative has been used, obviously prevalent across what everybody said. So culture, you know, obviously uh, coming up with great ideas comes upon kind of having boundaries and being sque having things squeezed in. I mean, it, what I, my question really is to probably ask each how they think they can bridge the gap uh, in their own cultures that they seem developing within their companies to kind of uh, create the environment that allows good production to happen because we're talking about in many ways a reductive, a very reductive part kind of process. So, uh, and, and one thing that agencies do do well is that they create a culture that, is, uh, that kind of runs through a production. And they allow that diversity to kind of develop and great ideas to kind of flourish. Um, and in, in, in having kind of a compartmentalized process, 
how can that how can a culture be kind of handed across if you see what i mean to make things remain creative and great ideas and great production to come through long-winded question but you get the get the get the idea well my take would be if if i understand it correctly you're suggesting that without an agency there the culture wouldn't necessarily flow through For me, it comes a little bit to that sense of responsibility um, and a client taking it. But it's, I'm not just here to bash clients; that would be silly. Um, it, 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 yeah, I, you know, it's about parties coming together and it's about collaboration. And it's the thing that I've felt, frankly, coming into the industry from cold 10, 12 years ago, um, could be a lot better. And people playing alongside each other, learning. I think there's a sense of also maturing with a, with, a, with a client and with a, with a brand, um, being you know too ready to switch. Uh, it doesn't allow us to get to know deeply um, that product, that brand, uh, and to be able to, to, to take the clients and then the customers on the journey. So I think, yeah, it's a joint responsibility. We need to come together and, and aid, collaborate better and rub alongside each other a bit, bit better. I think, you know, Pat talked earlier on about perhaps creative agencies finding a role for themselves that can be purely creative and they'll need to figure that out how that works. If that's the case, then they're going to have to give up some of the things that they've traditionally been in control of and that's not easy um, emotionally for people who've been around at those agencies for a long time. But they will have to do it because otherwise brands will go somewhere else uh, and they'll find that there. So I don't know if that directly answers the question, but I think it's a joint responsibility to find and, and preserve that culture. I'd love to answer that. I think that um, I think, I think the, the problem is, about, is mainly about talent and getting those talent together early enough. So we did a thing a couple of years ago where we called the Little Black Book Academy. We started to train young producers and, and creatives and account people about how an ad, and this was a TV ad was really made. At some stage, Unilever found out about this and said, could you do one for us? So what we did was we took them through the process of making an ad with all the talent together from day one. So from PPM to music to post to agency. In fact, we've got a speaker here, I think. Who's at the end? Were you not? Were you there? Or no. You were, weren't you? Yeah, and I think. Well, yeah, no. I think I think that's what needs to happen. I think that's how you get the culture. You get the best talent together, and you get them together from the start of the job to the end of the job. And I think then you you, you share responsibility. You know, back to the the brand has got as much responsibility as the agency, as the post and the production company, or, or wherever the makeup is. But you need to get the talent together. It needs to be the right talent. Most of you probably think it's quite tough in a business like ours, because we're all about the money. Um, and you're right, to a point. Uh, but about a year ago, um, we sat back and thought, well, look, actually, if we look at ourselves internally, most of us are a bunch of practitioners, people who love great advertising. And so we decided to change, try and change the external perception of MCA. And as part of that, you might have seen in the last 12 months or so, a lot of the stuff that we write or I write um, on LBB or the fact that we've been out there to Cannes this year, um, you know, sharing the beach with, with uh, Matt. Um, and just trying to give the industry and particularly the ind independent production scene um, the idea that we're actually we, we are on your side. Uh, we really uh, want to do great advertising. The fact that we are within the creative process, trying to make sure the client's getting best value, yes, that is true. Um, but at the same time, we want the client to get the best work out at the same time. So, and When I was at Procter & Gamble, before I set up MCA, my boss said to me, make sure you get that balance of cost and creativity right, because if you can help the agency just deliver 1% more effectiveness, that pays for all the production cost. That was a kind of a light bulb moment for me. Uh, so I've tried to instill those values into all of my team. Uh, it's quite difficult because when you take on people in different places around the world, they have a perception of what we do, and it's normally cost control in the traditional sense. Um, so we have to do ongoing training and webinars and uh, making sure that they're doing things in the right way, in the same way that we all want MCA team to work. So hopefully, the experience of anybody who encounters us, either from a client perspective or 
working in an agency or a production company, hopefully it's a pretty good one. Well, I can just, again, two days surrounded by 15,000 practitioners in, in the digital space. The two trends I've seen now, again, re reconfirmed. Um, I mean, Luke's background being in the, in the consulting area, would you imagine that a company called Accenture hires creative people? Would you imagine that? Deloitte has a company called Deloitte Digital. They have 5,000 people now, including creative people. Now, they're trying to sell creativity as a consultant. Sorry. They have some success on a certain kind of clientele. Puts the one in creative stories. And then on the other hand, you have independent agencies, two buys, three people, very creative, who are selling digital storylines to the 20, 25 year old customers. So I see these two trends, very small creative agencies who understand really well how digital engagement works, how in apps work. And people who understand that digital field and being creative, they're super successful. So I think that is a, a real nice challenge and a real nice opportunity for all the agencies to hire people who understand how digital works. And don't forget this creativity, because creativity lives in the digital world very well. But you need to really engage with it, and you need to know how it works. So um, for example, you know Andrew Fox, who works for Honeycomb, uh, he does a fantastic job in engaging with our audience, engaging with our customers, and establishing a brand because he understands how the digital world works. And with native advertising or native content that, that CNET is doing, it's just a complete different content production, engagement with the audience. It's very creative. And I think that's a, that's a huge potential going forward. That's very kind. <laughs> I, I, I mean, from, from our perspective, we're, we're a very different part of the value chain. We're a very different size of business. Um, culture is everything. Uh, we're competing for talent against some of the biggest companies in the world, for talent which, which we find very difficult to recruit because we are in one of the hardest con uh, cities in the world to recruit this talent. So culture is everything. Um, and I'd say alongside that, if you think about the people that we're trying to to sell to, people don't buy platforms. That's not what people do. People buy from people. That's, that's really what it's about. It's about the personal relationships that, that those two, three, four, five people who sit around a table and get together, and they buy from you because they believe that in buying your service, not only are they solving their challenges, but they also believe that you're going to give something extra on top. You're, you're a leader in your industry. You've got some insight and some real knowledge or you just care about that business in a way that some of the other providers don't. Um, and so at the core of the culture that we try and build at CNIT, we know that a great idea can come from anywhere. Um, and actually, some of our most creative and talented people are the people who have only joined the business in the last couple of weeks and have joined as junior members of the team. And they completely change our entire perception of how we might think about rolling the business forward. And I think. That's the most important thing for us, and that's the thing that we fight not to lose as obviously that team grows, and it becomes harder to retain that, that culture. Thank you very much. I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, so I think for, for me, you know, there were some, some key messages there around uh, the needs of the client and the, sort of the expectation that the client is beginning to bring services in-house. To me, that feels like a trust issue. Um, and it feels that there's an opportunity there for um, us collectively as an industry 
to re-win the trust and respect uh, of the brands, uh, to do what is right, demonstrably right by them, rather than what might be perceived as you know, right for ourselves or our P&Ls. Uh, content, obviously, was a, a core message of what we've just been talking about. Um, so, um, guys, I'm just going to sort of take a couple of seconds. Please join me in thanking uh, the uh, panel. Um, and And of course, now the bit you've all been waiting for, the bar. Um, the panel are going to be here, so please you know, feel free to hang around, continue conversations, go deeper, and uh, just enjoy the rest of the evening. Uh, but thank you all for joining us. <laughs>